So welcome to the Warren Lectures. And um, our speaker today is Prof Professor Michaela Goella, who is our colleague. Uh, Professor Goella was educated in Italy. He has PhD from University of Padua. After okay. that, he held several very prestigious postdoc positions at, uh, in Switzerland uh, at uh, ETH, right? And uh, Caltech. And about 10 years ago, he joined the department. And currently, he's an associate professor and also associate uh, head of research at SAFL. And Professor Guella has an NSF career award. His interests are in uh, experimental fluid mechanics, turbulence, and sediment transport with application to renewable energy. And I will keep this introduction short and please welcome Professor Guella. Thank you very much for this introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I will talk about uh, bed form and vortex organization. And uh, um, I, I kind of enjoyed preparing this talk because it gave me an opportunity to look at these two aspects of my research uh, and try to put them together. A lot of credit will go to my PhD student. So former PhD student Mirko Musa and Michael Heisel and the current PhD student Jiang Li, among uh, a lot of collaborators, former students and uh, former uh, advisor that I have to recognize. I'm also thankful to the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory and to the Department of Civil Engineering because this has been a great time for me. So I'm gonna talk about, uh, I'm gonna start with some evidence and look at some temporal signals that are here. And uh, I'm not telling what they are, but they, they share some uh, similarities, some dynamics, some multi-scale feature, and, uh, and some uh, kind of uh, ramp-like aggregation. And uh, those are different things. So this one is the evolution of the sediment bed with the bed form dunes moving and ripples being on top. So here, and this is represented essentially velocity time series in a, in a turbulent boundary layer. This is a streamless velocity and these little dots here occur when uh, the probe is, or the virtual probe, is uh, essentially perceiving a, a vortex. And this is kind of what we have there. This is the whole boundary layer system with the fluctuating velocity. These are all the vortex, and this was my virtual probe here. But the idea is that there are some similarities between the field of bed elevation and the field of velocity in a turbulent flow. And this is the stock exchange in Milan, which has a similar feature as well, but I'm not talking about stocks now. So let's give a little overview on what are the fluvial dunes. Uh, these two papers are excellent reference. And as you see here, the dune propagate with the flow. We have a large scale feature that the dune itself and on top you have moving ripples. Uh, they have a quasi triangular shape and uh, they uh, feature bed form superimposition and the height reaches about one third of the depth. Okay, more or less. This is a number that many people agree on. And they are not only on earth uh, uh, because the dunes develop not only in a flow and a river, but also eolian dunes. These are the largest dune on earth is on the Namibia sea sand. And this is uh, Morocco the Kaiser crater on Mars and a collection pretty much throughout the entire solar system. And they all kind of uh, share this uh, quasi triangular shape. These summer Barton dunes are a little different. They evolve over a non erodible bottom. They experience bad form superimposition, so multi scale feature. And the height is a little tricky with the Olean dunes. It's supposed to scale with the boundary layer depth, but uh, it's uh, it's a very big question in geomorphology, what is setting the height of the dunes there? So they reach about 150 meters and it's not exactly clear why they cannot go beyond that as the supply of sediment is still available in a desert. So this is a, a, question, a question mark there. Now, when we go to 
coherent structure in turbulent flow, what we observe is a similar ramp-like pattern. Here, I'm looking at the velocity spatial correlation in a water tunnel. What does it mean? I'm taking a, a velocity fluctuation. I look along which direction the velocity is more correlated to itself. And, uh, and uh, in water tunnel, in the uh, SL test, these are some in Utah, so atmospheric boundary layer, the first uh, two, three meter of the atmospheric boundary layer. This is a laser visualization in Utah desert by Homem and Adrian. These are some vortex correlation, meaning that uh, all this uh, inclined velocity, or this tendency of the velocity to uh, align along a preferential direction, which is uh, between eight and 15 degrees, somewhere there, it's also characterized by an alignment of vertical structure. And these are the results from the Minnesota snow cover field, so going up to 20 meters. So there is evidence that there is some type of ramp-like organization in turbulent flow as well. And this is the really nice uh, movie that I hope you should be able to see. Yes, this is a, a snowstorm in Minnesota and where we could uh, basically image the particle and look at the fluctuating field subtracting the settling velocity of the snow. And you see that there are ramp-like features with the several aligned vortex with an inclination that uh, kind of resembles a, a dune field in some sense. So at least we see vertical alignment and a shear layer uh, that has a similar inclinations to the stoss angle in a dune, okay? Some more evidence is that uh, this uh, kind of inclined velocity organization is, or is, is a coherent uh, region, defines coherent region in which we have uh, shear layers in between and in the middle, uh, uh, a velocity region that is defined as a uniform momentum zone where there is not much activity as most of the shear and vorticity occurs along this shear layer. And some history, uh, this uh, structure here have been defined back in the time, but had them by in 1981, and they called ramp-like throat structures. So ramp-like exactly as a, as a dune may, may be defined with an inclination angle of 815 degree. There's, they define region of preferential alignment of vortices and coherence of streamless velocity fluctuation. So that's why they have been kind of overlapping with vortex cluster, hairpin packets, and this uniform momentum zone, UMZ. And they also call large scale or delta structure because they grow proportional to the boundary layer height. So not only the one similarity again between dunes and this type of structure is that there is a confinement effect from the outer scale in, in, in for instance, the river depth or the turbulent boundary layer height. So let's say that in this uh, qualitative I admit comparison. We have some geometrical feature, some multi-scale features, and a confinement effect feature from the outer scale. But then we will wonder ourselves, what about kinematics? And to answer about kinematics, I go back to something I did a long time ago. And I, I think I presented a bit to you already, but we will have a second time. Uh, so this is uh, an experiment we did at St. Anthony Falls Laboratory. We, measure bed elevation in time and space with a car that was able to repeat the same transect in the longitudinal direction and essentially map the bed elevation field in, uh, in, in space for different experiments. You see, these are basically ripples with some dunes and this is really a dune field in a gravel bed and this is with sand. And this is the X time uh, uh, contour map that shows essentially that different structure have different uh, 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 inclinations, so convection velocity. How can we be a bit quantit quantitative? Well, first of all, we take the, we have a signal in space and time. We can decompose in many harmonics in the temporal uh, domain or in the, and to get uh, the frequency for the different dunes or ripples that form uh, the bathymetry, and we can get the frequency spectrum. And we can do the same in space, where we, instead of talking about wave, um, frequency, we talk about wave number and we wavelength instead of the period. 
but we can also decompose everything and get the wave number spectrum. And we can also do a 2D FFT in frequency and wave number that will allow to essentially estimate how much energy is in the various mode that in this case are traveling and they move with a certain convection velocity that is defined essentially by the ridge, okay, of this uh, uh, plot. So if we go from a sketch to something more serious, this is the spatial and temporal spectra of bed topography, the frequency spectra F normalized with the um, diameter, send diameter and the shear velocity and the wave number spectra there. And one thing that we observe aside of some variability with sand and gravel is that the frequency spectra goes with the minus two while the wave number spectra is more going along a minus three decay power law. And uh, what does it mean? It means that the steeper slope in the wave number suggests that the frequency wave number conversion cannot be implemented with a constant convection velocity. And uh, which means that there is a systematic effect or a scale dependent convection velocity. This was observed by Hino and Nicora. Uh, so how do we estimate the scale dependent convection velocity? Well, we take the uh, 2D FFT results and here in wave number and, and period time, we fit uh, uh, whatever we can to this uh, ridge. And uh, we, uh, every point of this ridge is fact represents uh, a lambda divided by T, so a convection velocity. And uh, this has been done also in for turbulent flow and we'll see in a minute. But the idea is that we have this power law that is fitted here. We can propose a different uh, dimensionally consistent constant for, for the, the B here. So that will be C U star DS. And we can rearrange and get a scaling relationship between essentially the wavelength and the period. All uh, dimensionless using uh, what I call uh, frictional scale. So the sediment diameter and the shear velocity. And when we map everything here on the period uh, wave wavelength uh, plot, we see that all the experiment kind of collapse nicely. This is the, this contour here. And they are different from this slope here. And this slope would correspond to a constant convection velocity. That is what we do in turbulence. So in turbulence, we take signal in space and time. We apply the so-called frozen turbulence hypothesis by Taylor, and we're all happy. But we cannot do it here. So what is the frozen turbulence hypothesis? The frozen turbulence hypothesis, we take a true flow in space. We record from a Met tower or any kind of signal, any kind of instrumentation, which is fixed, uh, we record the velocity time series, so in time, we project the time series rigidly, so frozen in space, okay? So now we go from time to space rigidly. We, we do all kind of analysis we want, and, and we are happy with that, because, but in fact, we should remember that if we take this projected signal, we go back to the, to the real flow, and we compare, they cannot be the same. Exactly, right? The statistics are the same, but uh, there will be some distortion. It's just this distortion is kind of chaotic, random, is not uh, systematic, a scale dependent uh, distortion. So the scale dependent distortion, so, and one thing uh, that allows uh, is that we can use all kinds of spatial and temporal signal to get, for instance, the famous minus five over three spectrum of the velocity fluctuation, that is the energy cascade is one of the uh, most famous plot in turbulence that we all agree that the turbulence will decay, the energy will decay with the minus five over three. And if we do in this case, uh, a frequency wave number to the FFT, basically our ridge will be very much aligned with the mean convection velocity. What does it mean? It means that uh, pretty much all the scale travel 
with the local convection velocity. So a little scale close to the wall will travel with the mean velocity close to the wall. The larger scale here will travel with this velocity to the mean velocity far from the wall. So in the bad form, instead, we have this kind of law, which means that the velocity of any kind of surface feature as a function of its scale will be inversely proportional to lambda. So will be lower, larger structure or larger bed form will travel a lower velocity. Or we can do it the same in time and say that the convection velocity will be slower for longer period. So in other words, the convection velocity is scale dependent. We cannot rigidly project the signal into space because statistically, for instance, the small scale ripples travel much faster than the slow dunes. And therefore we cannot uh, simply go from space to time easily in a rigid uh, translation, but we have to use a scale dependent convection velocity. So they're not frozen. Now, one thing we can wonder is that, is this true or is just an exercise in the frequency wave number domain? Uh, because we may have an imperfect decomposition of the triangular dunes into sinusoids. So we, we take triangular dunes or ramp like shape and we decompose. So maybe we have some artifacts. So what Jiang did, uh, he took a really nice signal from the main channel experiment at Suffolk. He recognized all the bed forms. He was able to track them, to define them, uh, the height, the geometry, all the possible angles decompose them a little bit into signal the high pass and low pass to make sure that we were really able to get both the over ripples and the underlying dunes moving and track them in time. So get the velocity for each of these platforms knowing their length. And we could uh, compare with the uh, uh, collection of bed forms from Bradley and Venditti make sure we are on the same page, make sure we, we get all the possible bad form that are occurring in the, in the field. And we were happy with that. Uh, then uh, we also did some particle image velocimetry or bathymetric image velocimetry in which we correlate the little region defined by bad elevation and calculate the essentially a vector field that would allow also not only to estimate the velocity in one direction, but also some little distortion of the flow field. And what we obtained was a very consistent distribution of the, of the bed form velocity for all this type of uh, uh, signal, including this low pass filter. So the large dunes that indeed move a little slower. And when we compile all this, uh, basically, we found that if we plot uh, the bed form velocity as a function of the wavelet, indeed we see a trend of scale dependent convection velocity. So this is not only something that came up uh, from the food analysis, but this is a, a, a true characteristics of bed form, of true bed form, okay? At least in a range, in, in the low and high, uh, low, small and large bed form, very small and very large, it was uh, fairly uh, constant, but we were happy with that. So let's say that geometrical features are fine. The kinematics is not really fine. Uh, but however, when we compare the scaling properties, we understand that the ramp-like structures or turbulence, they do move uh, with the local mean velocity. That will be the log uh, law of the wall. While for dunes, uh, they move with the uh, scale dependent velocity, but they all, share some scaling features. So the shear velocity is there in all this representation. So it's a true uh, relevant velocity scale. So let's switch now to do a little bit more analysis on the, on the ramp-like organization. So this is what we've seen before, is this field of turbulent field of view with the shear layer, a lot of eddies organized into this shear layer. We understand the preferential vortex organization, shear layer orientation, everything is moving with the local mean flow, uh, even though they evolve in a shear, in a mean shear, because the boundary layer is not a constant velocity. Uh, so that has little effect. 
And one thing that is uh, important to remember and is that all these structures, these complex structure are defined as attached eddy structure. So attached eddy, what does it mean? Essentially, it means that uh, this structure in some sense remains attached and I will clarify that. So they can be smaller or larger. They can move uh, with a larger velocity because they are away from the wall. So they, they experience a larger mean flow but somehow they should be combined, able to provide a mean velocity profile at the end, okay? So let's see if this is true. This is a PIV field in the Suffolk wind tunnel. Uh, the streamer's velocity is uh, uh, plotted as a contour. Michael was able to look at the, the probability density function find the modal velocity, so the most uh, common velocity in all this uniform momentum zone, and able to separate them, so identify the shear layer, and basically transform this uh, flow field into a much more discretized flow field, in which we see essentially that we have a kind of a staircase defined by this uniform momentum zone passing by. And the one thing that is interesting is that if we sum all them up, so for many realizations, so on and so forth, we get back the mean velocity profile. Okay, so in some sense, we don't need, or not truly for the mean velocity profile, we don't need all this little jitter there, but we can, we can reproduce this just by a correct distribution of the modal velocity and some variability. Okay, that will occur time to time. This is just one frame realization. So let's call it an instantaneous staircase. And like Hogwarts, they move. So they move back and forth. And so now we have to do some statistics and understand, for instance, what is the velocity jump or the shear intensity of the velocity of this, uh, of this uh, interface between uniform momentum zones. And once the, we can plot them together for a whole variety of uh, experiment, DNS, uh, atmospheric surface layer data, so pretty much everything, we find this that this velocity jump here on average scales very well with the shear velocity. And not only that, so this will be the internal shear layer velocity jump and universal agreement with Utah. Not only that, now that we look at the step height, which will be the height of this uniform momentum zone, uh, this will be normalized with the actual height of the uniform momentum zone. So the location with respect to the wall. And, and again, we find a very, very good agreement. What does it mean? This is the true meaning of the attached structures. Okay, this is at the scaling is the UMZ thickness grow with the distance to the wall. So here, this zone is small and it's very close to the wall. Here, this, small, this zone is large and is farther from the wall and this all makes sense. So they carry in their thickness, the memory of where they are. So in this sense, they are attached to the wall. Again, all these measurements and uh, if we say, okay, well, how do they contribute to the mean shear? Well, it's kind of obvious, right? Because we have the step height, the step, the shear intensity. And so they should contribute correctly to the mean shear defined by the, essentially the log law of the wall. And indeed they do because they represent all the mean shear. What does it mean practically? Is that in the observation, we have this jump of scales with u tau and the height that goes with z. And if we compare to the mixing length theory and the von Karman constant, the 0.41 von Karman constant here, that's what we use to derive the log law. And basically they're absolutely consistent. So the physical meaning of the von Karman constant here is coming from the scaling of the UMZ and the contribution to the scale, okay? So whatever ways we want to go, uh, we will recover the mean velocity profile. 
and their variability. So if we if we go in time and we say, okay, let's replace the variability of the of the velocity signal with their actual modal velocity. So with the mean velocity of the uniform momentum zone, we have this step change. And if you include that, yes, we get the mean velocity profile and the RMS, almost the RMS velocity profile. So the, 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 the variance. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that uh, we can consider some low dimensional minimal modeling where if we get a correct distribution and temporal alternation of synthetic UMZ, we could reproduce the first order statistics. So by stochastically moving, possibly all this structure, we should be able to get back the mean velocity profile. So in some sense, we are using some uh, uh, kind of permeable dunes that could reproduce what's happening in a smooth or rough wall turbulent boundary layer. So again, we have geometrical features, okay, kinematics not okay, the scaling is not too bad. So we can propose an analogy, okay? That sediment grains aggregate in bed form in the same way or in a similar way in which vortices organize themselves into coherent structures. And uh, this is all qualitative, but there are some quantitative ramification here and there. So one is, for instance, that uh, we talk about aggregate, we can talk also about constitutive minimal element forming the aggregate. So that will be the sand grain. And we did track sand grain in the bottom of the river without dunes. This is a flatbed experiment. We tracked them when they were moving and when they were stopping. So we tracked them in space and time. So we analyzed the waiting time, the step time, the waiting time, and so on. We could get statistics pretty much everywhere there. One thing that was interesting is that the mean velocity of the actually sediment grain, the UP, the particle velocity in this low bed load, bed load transport mode is very, very comparable with the shear velocity. It scales over a variety of uh, transport intensity. And not only that, but also the waiting time so how much do they wait? And I say active waiting times because we have to differentiate when they wait for a long time and when they wait, but they wobble a bit. So when they wobble a bit, it means they remain exposed to the flow and their waiting time depends essentially on the alternation in time of this coherent structure that sweep the floor again and cause them to move again. But again, the shear velocity is critical. And if we go with the, now with the vortex itself, and again, I showed this video, it really clear shows where the shear layer is and where the vortices tend to be. Uh, we can look at instantaneous vortices. So again, a great effort. Michael was able to take a OSIN two-dimensional vortex model fit it to every vortex we recognize in the field for all these experiments we look, look at the size of the eddy and look at the, the azimuthal velocity of the eddy. So how fast is it actually turning? And uh, one thing that uh, among many, but the one thing I want to show is that when we take the PDF of the Delta U, so the azimuthal velocity over all these uh, 16,000 and more at, uh, vortices that you find, Basically, it falls once it's normalized by this region here that takes into account the fact that we are imaging vortices and observation field of different size. So we have some resolution effect in this region. But once we account for that, the probability distribution of the azimuthal velocity is exponential and is very, very much agreeing for all these case. And uh, when scale with U tau, basically we find that uh, the delta U tau basically represent uh, the, the shear velocity represent the true scaling for the azimuthal velocity of these eddies. What does it mean? These, these eddies are formed, they're lifted up 
and they carry on the information of the shear velocity throughout the boundary layer, which is really interesting to me because I always wonder why the shear velocity, which is a classic near wall scale, is defined in the mean velocity profile throughout the entire boundary layer. Well, through the vortex and through the shear layer. So now we know the shear layer that we saw before and the, and the single vortex that we see now, they all carry the U tau or the shear velocity scaling throughout the, the whole boundary layer. So what we can say is that uh, in, the, in the roughness sub layer, we still have a different population of eddies, so we cannot solve all the problems. Uh, but with the synthetic uh, kind of coherent structure moving, we can take care of the shear. And so this is, these are two different population of eddies, one that stays attached to the wall and, uh, and uh, with some size and characterize the roughness of layer, the one that stays along the shear layer. And in fact, when we look at the experiment with the hemispherical with some roughness type, we can clearly see the two population of edges there. The one that is aligned along the ramp-like structure and the one that stay close. And if we do a more, a two-point correlation analysis, looking at uh, how the vertical structure are correlated to themselves in specific region, we do find uh, statistically these two patterns of population. So what we can learn is that uh, there are structure close to the wall that depend on the roughness of the wall. And then we have uh, uh, different structure, let's say in the log layer and outer layer, which could uh, be modeled as a permeable ramp-like structure, which in the case limit could be a quasi-static ramp-like structure, which is a dune impact. So the idea is that these two, the minimal modeling of these two cases could share the same type of framework, basically. Now, one thing uh, to remember is that both platform and touch of the structure depend on the shear velocity, but outer scale non-frictional effect may be considered. What does it mean? That we are all happy that the shear velocity is there as dominant scale, but uh, we also understand that the dunes are limited by the river depth or by the boundary layer depth, as well as ramp-like structure are also limited by the boundary layer height. So there is a confinement effect. So how can we test if this confinement effect represents an outer scale that is contaminating our frictional scaling? So in the turbulent under layer, we have the Reynolds number that defines the scale separation. So we have the outer scale, which is a boundary layer height or the river depth and a viscous inner scaling that is defined by the kinetic viscosity divided by the shear velocity. And this defines essentially two scales that govern the boundary layer. So if you want to find a ratio of scale separation in bad forms, well, we can replace the sediment diameter with the, the viscous length scale and introduce a new parameter, which is H over DS, which is uh, close to what Chris Paolo defined as uh, granularity. So this, in my view, represent uh, the scaling range that is available for self-organization between the confinement effect of the delta scale of the river depth and the confinement effect of the little sand grain roughness. So how do we test that? Well, we did experiment uh, in uh, the main channel that should also be moving. But we did really nice experiment here in the main channel. And we did, uh, we collect data from Diamond Clay Colorado River. So I did not collect this data. This has come from Paul Grams in the ESGS. And basically we replotted again the two dimensional FFT in the frequency wave number domain, including everything from the tilting bed flume, let's say 50 meter to 80 meter of the main channel to the 400 meters of the 
Colorado Creek. And uh, this gives us an idea of the size. So this is the tilting belt flume with ripples, dune, and will be represented here. This is the main channel. And this main channel will be represented here. This is the Colorado River. So all kind of difference in outer scale. And what we found is that basically there is a little effect. So if we plot a, a, a scaling law that we know in there, we will find that the intercept here is varying. So it's not constant anymore as we thought, but there is a weak dependency of H over DS. And so we were able to correct and basically find a new scaling law in which we have the frictional dependency, but also we have a weak dependency on the outer scale, which should be accounted for. So, and not only that, but we could get, uh, if M is 0 0.25 instead of 0 0.2, the fit we had, I'm almost done, don't worry. So we had the 0 0.2 feet here, but if we relax a bit, because this can be really un unclear, or then we could uh, get out the mixed land scale L, so which is essentially the geometrical mean between the sediment diameter and the river depth, and, and get a, 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 a nicer result in terms of uh, velocity of the platform that include the frictional scaling and the outer scaling. And we plotted there and we were quite happy to see the collapse. So now we believe we have a way to interpret and to model the scale dependent convection velocity for platform across all kinds of range of rivers and streams and everything. So I'm essentially almost done. So the dunes may appear today as a crystallized form of statistically dominant and dynamically relevant turbulent structure. Is that the only type of flow where we have uh, this uh, similarity between an erodible bed, what we see in an erodible bed, and what we see in a turbulent flow? Well, there are two, two cases. One is the streaks near the wall. The streaks near the wall, through a very elegant analysis by Columbini and Parker, they can uh, they're represented by hydrogen bubbles. The hydrogen bubble carry the eddies, the vortices. And in this, so they mark the vortices. And in these vortices, you can see accumulation of sediments. So they've shown and explained theoretically that there are streaky deposition of fine sand on the bottom wall due to the fact that uh, this near wall streak, instead of moving, they are kind of stabilized by the fine sand depositing preferentially. The second uh, case study is the very large scale structure. So structure that don't scale with the depth, but they extend much farther to six, 10 times the length of the boundary layer scale or the outer scale. And this structure, they also meander, they have seen pretty much everywhere. And one thing interesting is that they can be stabilized, for instance, by a grid or any obstacle in the cross section of a flume that would give a, kind of would force this structure to go around. And by forcing them, the sediment will uh, reorganize itself. And so what we see is that this grid does not only have a local effect of accumulate, uh, deposition and erosion, but is also flipped. And so with Marco, we could, uh, Marco Redolfi, we could demonstrate that this is a way in which very large scale structure can be essentially crystallized and become a distortion of the mean bed. And uh, this could be perhaps a solution to renaturalize this river. And we've seen a very nice seminar last week from Ellen Wall, who said, messy rivers are healthy rivers. So, that could be a way to renaturalize and restart the meandering because now these are permanent deformation of the bed. So here we will have erosion and we'll have also side bank erosion as well here. So we could define as an onset of meander. And so we are done here. We have to the conclusion that I leave it down there. And uh, 
I can take any question and thank you a lot for your attention. But uh, so if you have any question. Um, okay, thank you very yeah. much, Michaela. Yeah. Uh, now floor is open for questions. We also have online participants. Okay, the first question is here. Thank you for nice talk. Uh, do you have any estimates of the ratio between the microscopic kinetic energy and the coherent macroscopic one? Um, so in, in terms of uh, like contribution to the variance, let's say. In the overall energy, right? So which, which, which mechanism is energetically dominant? Microscopic yeah. turbulence or macroscopic? Dune movement. Oh, for the dunes. Yeah. Well, for the dunes, uh, uh, I'm thinking how to relate the, the two things. Uh, so, you by energy you mean the variance of the bed elevation field. The kinetic or, energy. I do not know how to. So you're trying you to connect the, the two. Energy contained in the in, in micro turbulences and and everything else versus the macroscopic kinetic energy of the particles. So the, the, both the, the two fields of bed elevation and velocity field, they have a sharp decay in the spectrum. So the, the, um, in, in the velocity field, it will go down to minus five over three. And in the, in the dune field, that will go down to minus two which means that the energy drops pretty significantly. Now, the peak of the spectrum, however, is on the production scale in turbulence, and that's of the order of the boundary layer height. And that corresponds to the peak in the dune field, which is of the order of uh, the height of the dune, which correspond to, let's say, according to most of the morphologies, we'll say one third of the dune. So, I don't know if that answered to your question, but it seems that the peak of the spectra, which describes the scale dependent uh, um, contribution to the, to the energy, both peaks at somewhere around uh, of the scale of the, of the uh, river depth. And, uh, and, and then we have, uh, now, and then all the rest essentially represents uh, the, the the little vortices or the ripples okay so we i don't know exactly the proportion but we can discuss this of later. the ripple yeah 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 too much of time. Thank you. but they do share the outer scale as a scaling group on the standard in the real time okay we have questions here Makeda, yes thanks for the talk you know this this analogy with uh, fluid flow turbulence has been kind of often put forward but it seems to me that the it seems to me that the um, the analogy with fluid flows. I'm repeating it because I don't think I had the mic. I think the mic has often been put forward before. But it seems to me from your talk that the actual behavior that you see in the dune systems is actually richer and more complex than it might be in the fluid flow turbulence case. So shouldn't it actually be the other way around that actually the the, the movement of dunes should be seen as the kind of benchmark and everything else should be everyone else's behavior should be compared with that or do you still think that fluid flow tur turbulence is still a kind I, I of benchmark at, place that you should start from well i look at that from the point of view of the forcing that the system that the granular system is uh, exposed to and it is exposed to a turbulent flow field so the way i see it is that turbulence uh, try to enforce uh, its own scale to the depositional system. And then the sand grains uh, essentially pick the scale that they want to pick and they develop uh, ripples, they develop dunes, uh, they move, they just move uh, one sand grain a little bit and it stops and move again, but it's all defined or by the, the streaks they deposit along uh, preferential direction. So it seems like that there is a forcing scale uh, of turbulence and, and then the response 
if you want, a frequency response of the uh, deposition system of the erodible bed that amplifies some and dampens some other. Okay. Yeah, questions here. This side. Thanks, Michaela, for a nice talk. Um, I was curious about you. You kind of touched at it or touched on it at the very end, but I was curious about the application of this work. And and you talked about how it could maybe be used for river restoration. I wondered with your storm work uh, and the atmospheric boundary layer if it could be used for predicting um, like where more damaging winds might be. But I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about how um you kind of collapsing all of these patterns together how that could be used um in an application so there are two two applications uh, that i have in mind uh, one is that what we see here if you have a, a, a channelized uh, river and what the stream restoration or stream renaturalization is trying to do sometimes is really to design and impose a meandering stream design an autopad and impose it to the river. That may work or not. You know, we, there are some famous example in which after the first flood, everything went, uh, uh, was destroyed. So in this system, we, the grid is one example, like you could put uh, a patch of vegetation, of strong vegetation on one side of the channel. And what happens is that you really destabilize. And the one important thing is that's to go to mid the channel depth, mid channel width. So the width is important. You cannot just perturb on one side, on the little side. It has to be a finite so-called perturbation of the river. And then uh, depending on the characteristic of the river, because I didn't say that, but uh, when we say sub-resonant, the, 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 the resonance condition depends on the ratio between the width and the depth. And, and so different rivers respond in different ways. And there are some conditions that are called resonant in which this can propagate for a long space, both downstream and upstream. So under this condition, if we know what the resonant value is and what the width to depth ratio is, we can kind of tune the optimal response and let the river evolve and that will save a lot of money, plus the river will find the course that he wants to take. So it will be more sustainable and more cheap, but it's a risk, right? Because you are perturbing an unstable system and, and you have to hope everything goes well, essentially. So the other application, and I have just one slide here. This is something we are working on with Jong a lot. And it's... Uh, we now have a, a, we do have a formula for the scale dependent convection velocity. So we know how much bed from different sizes are moving. And the idea is uh, that uh, we can take a, a, a sonar sensor that would give a bed elevation in time, get the frequency spectrum. So scale dependent uh, uh, amplitude for, for, for each time and couple it with the scale dependent velocity to get a scale dependent mass flux. So if you do that with a single sensor, we could get an estimate of how much sediment transport we have transporting in, in the bed form, which is quite important. It becomes a bit difficult to have a So that is one way to get the very A solid uh, representation of the real time measurement of sediment transport would not require any kind of application. You can just go in the black box, which is all very clean and entertaining, coupling with the, our analytical model and get an idea of what the spectrum mass flux would be. Yeah. 
I was wondering about uh, cohesion of the grains. Is any consideration given to that? What role is does that play? Is it different in dry, you know, desert environment versus aquatic submerged environments? And could you could you comment on on that and the, the role and whether you're considering that? And I don't know. <laughs> What I can comment is that this is a good point. <laughs> and cohesion makes things complicated because we lose uh, essentially the, 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 the confining land scale at, at the small scale because the, with, the, with cohesive sediment, uh, they form flocks. When they are eroded, they are eroded in big uh, chunks. And, and, and the forces that the cohesive forces are not accounted here. So I'm, I'm talking about a strictly granular material. Now, this said, uh, the analysis we did on the bed forms, it could apply to any bed form. We are not really strictly uh, defining uh, the, I mean, there are, there are bed forms of different type, uh, also with cohesive material. So we can apply that to any kind of uh, uh, bed elevation field. Even though exactly we have a problem with the definition of the S, I think, because it, it's not anymore the minimal component. Um, regarding the, the analysis of the like of the bed perturbation, I would say that uh, the, the the shear stress, the active shear stress that will mobilize the grain has to be estimated. Uh, properly because with cohesive sediments, uh, let's say the classic uh, shields analysis is, is a little weak, I would say. So the force that is required to mobilize the sediment for a grain of sand that can be reconstructed, you can go to first principle, look at the drag, the lift, everything, and, and you can get a, a decent answer. But with cohesive sediment, this is more complicated. And, uh, and so it's, it's, it's a good point. Uh, uh, it's definitely something that has to be done. I, I'm not very experienced with crazy sediment, but I think uh, I'll say a good portion of it uh, could be applied, but some care has to be taken. It's definitely a sticky situation. Uh, Michele, thank you for nice talk. Uh, I have a, a couple of uh, questions because this is an open discussion as the title of your talk. Yes. So through your talk, you use the shear velocity or friction velocity as a universal velocity scale to a large extent. Yeah. It's a, an topic, yes. And, uh, but uh, as you know, we cannot measure shear velocity. Shear velocity we estimate based, I guess, in your case, logarithmic uh, velocity distribution. Yeah. Now, there are many flows in the environment, for example, streams with a rough bed, uh, where the velocity does not follow logarithmic law. So my first question is uh, uh, how this analysis uh, is appropriate if you don't have a log law? And the second, uh, more like a comment uh, regarding the turbulence uh, in your spectrum, you can see sharp decay in the energy that uh, may in a steady state uh, implicate that you have active turbulence from large scale where it is generated down to dissipation scales. There are many flows in the environment like stratified flows where we in the atmosphere, in lakes in my case, where you don't see this uh, sharp decay. You can see decay and plateau, decay and plateau, which indicates the turbulence is not active through all scales. So now how this analysis apply for so-called non-active turbulence through the all scales? That's a good question. So let me say, first of all, in, a, in many situations, like in a river, we can use the energy slope to get the U star. So even if we don't have uh, 
a logarithmic velocity profile, we can still get U star essentially by the free surface law. And that accounts essentially all the shear stress that you have in the, in the river balanced by the potential energy due to the, we have a slope in the free surface. So we have a forcing uh, um, by, by gravity. So that, that's one, one, one little answer. The second answer is that, uh, as I wrote here, the shear velocity is not only a parameter fit in the log law. So, but we can find tracks of the shear velocity pretty much in everything. We can find track in the moving particle. When we find track in the spinning eddies, we can find track in the shear layers. So even if we don't have a log law, we could, of course, it's very time, very consuming, time consuming, but we could find uh, uh, possibly a track of the shear velocity in all this uh, uh, analysis. So in, of course you say, well, but then you have to do PIV in a real river and track the eddies or track the shear layer. Yes, it's, it's impractical. It's, it's impractical, but, uh, but it is possible, at least theoretically what we demonstrated, I hope uh, it shows that is, is possible. Um, the other point was what happens when you don't have uh, an inertial range, a, a very clean inertial range. And, and that is happening for, as you said, variety of region. One is that the turbulence is not is passive in some scales. The other one could be that, for instance, if you have a very strong uh, platform field, you may have an injection of energy at, at some other scales. And so uh, you don't have only the, the self-aggregation scale of all the energy production the usual way, but we have some input of energy here and there that we cannot uh, account for. And, uh, and in, that, in that case, uh, I, I am not sure what uh, can be done except going down into the details of the, 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 the flow structure. Um, what was the question on the, on, the, um, on, on the case where we don't have the minus five or three? Through the stream depth in your case down to dissipation scale. So how this analysis is uh, appropriate? Yeah. It can be applied only in some regions. For instance, uh, it could be applied from the wind forcing down to the thermocline or from the way, um, say stream forcing down to the bottom, the benthic boundary layer. But in between, so above and below the thermocline, and uh, we need something else for sure. Yeah. Do we have a question here? Yes, Kimberly online has a question. Hi, Michele. Thanks for the interesting talk. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to follow up a little bit on Vaughn's question and your answer to it. Um, and that has to do with Vaughn's pointing out, well, it seems like in some ways the the dune, if I interpreted it correctly, the dune length scales and the dune patterns maybe are even more varied than the turbulence patterns. Um, but in any case, um, and, and you responded in a way that it was the, the sediments response to the turbulence forcing that sort of set up these patterns. And I'm wondering, um, as you know, there are um, very interesting different length scales in granular materials as well. You know, in addition to their particle size, um, depending on their forcing, they set up, um, you know, that like what's loosely or very sloppily been called force chains, but clusters of particles in, you know, in contact with one another, propagating um, the contact more than just propagating a forcing more than just locally. And I'm wondering um, if you have heard of anyone looking into um, the sort of these um, length scale based or discrete length scale based responses within the, within the granular bed as part of the forcing and, and looking, looking for length scales in that as well, or trying to relate the length scales to the, to the, um, the, the what might be called 
for lack of a better word, force clusters or, or cluster scale. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a good point. Uh, what I can, what I said to Vaughn, and I, I think I, I kind of stand to the answer is that uh, the, 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 the granular material in the, in the sediment bed essentially respond to the forcing by turbulence in not in a direct way, but in it's, it's filtering it, right? So uh, I suppose that whatever is happening, not at the scale of the single grain, but as a scale of the grain of, uh, of a cluster of grain uh, is, uh, is essentially modulating that response. So if uh, I know what's happening below the first layer of sand, which I don't, but in, in case, right? Uh, uh, that would give me an idea of what kind of scales uh, will propagate uh, through the granular system, ideally. Like I know, for instance, that a lot of energy is dissipated in, in a porous. So if you, if you, instead of considering a rough, the, the riverbed as a, a, a rough wall, you consider it as a permeable material, a lot of energy is dissipated there. All the sweeps are kind of dying. So they're a sink of kinetic energy, which means that uh, there is, it works almost like a, a dense canopy, which means that inside the, the granular material, things happen and they experience uh, some scale that uh, for instance, may recall or what's happening on uh, in a canopy floor with some kind of a mixing layer. And, and those scales are, are affecting uh, the subsurface and the subsurface will respond to those scales in a way that I don't know. But you probably have an idea of that. So I, I think uh, whatever happens to the granular material scale in the subsurface will, uh, will represent the filter response of the, of the bed to the forcing scale imposed by the turbulence. And somehow some, some scale will be amplified, some scales will be amp dampened, and we will see the result in the bathymetry. Does it make sense? Sure, it might be fun to talk about that further on another day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay, I think we reached the end of the seminar because of in sake of time, it was interesting seminar with a lot of questions. Please join me in thanking Michaela.